it's Ben Nico again with part two of the podcast with Yoris on research in aging. For everyone who hasn't listened to part one, I recommend you go do that as we've covered a lot of interesting research and this episode will be a continuation of the first part. I really hope that you enjoy this part just as much as we did. So let's just jump straight into it right now and start by talking about the Yamanaka factors. Going back to these Yamanaka factors, do we all have the, are, they're genes, right? Um, correct me if my biology, biological terms are incorrect. Yeah, so we all have them, we all have them expressed uh, in our cells in the sense that during development they are highly expressed and in the stem cells they are highly expressed. In the rest of our body, we have the genetic makeup to express them, but they are not expressed. So what we could do is we could give it to the cells and then they start expressing them. Um, but in the normal state, they wouldn't express them. Although they, with the genes we have, it's just that they, during development, they are expressed a lot. And then afterwards they are shut down except in the specific kind of cells that will need to keep rejuvenating. So the way is now you just have to trigger that in the cells and then you can express them again, or you just give these factors in the cells themselves so that they are expressed again but every human has these factors i mean so these these factors they're also I, as far as i uh, remember they're also uh, relevant in cell proliferation right so doesn't like um if you then overexpress them or like cause them to be active again can this also lead to like uh, overgrowth as is seen in cancer or is there some connection there yeah, so actually what they do is they will bring them back to the, the youthful state. So it's, it's, it's that they may, if a cell is expressing, it, it has become, for example, a liver cell. The idea is that you would express these factors and then it becomes an undifferentiated cell again. In that sense, that it can then still become whatever it, it wants. So they use this a lot. Um, I don't know if you have heard about immunofluorescence. Um, induced pluripotent, pluripotent stem cells. So what they do, they take a cell from a human, they put it in culture, they put these factors on it, and then this cell becomes this pluripotent stem cell. And what that means is that that cell, you can then differentiate in whatever you want next. So you kind of make a cell that was already differentiated, you bring it back to an undifferentiated state, and then you can do whatever you want. And that's also so these Yama, Yama, Yamaka factors do that. They bring the cell, differentiated cell, back to an undifferentiated state, after which then you can um, do all kinds of things with it. And that makes it also more useful. So the idea is also that when you remove the differentiation, the cells become useful again. That's how it, uh, that's the bit of the mechanism. So you wouldn't expect this in cancer because you wouldn't expect cancer to do it. Actually, you would potentially think that cancer does the opposite, that differentiates the cell into something. But in this case, um, you wouldn't expect that it directly leads to cancer. On the other hand, it could uh, promote cell growth if you do, of course, something um, to your body. Um, and this is always a risk of these kind of treatments that um, you never know where the right balance is before something turns into cancer or that it actually is still good enough. Um, so that's always a challenge. So how far are we with this research in Yamanaka factors? Is it, is it still at its infancy or has it been developed quite well now in mice, for example, that we would be able to see if it could, if we could rejuvenate cells in humans? Yeah, so it, I would say it's, it's in mice it's completely developed in the sense that they are already applying it and it and seems to work. Um, so I think they are now working on the next step to indeed see, okay, can we bring it to the human? And how do we safely bring it to the humans? Because in the mice it works. So 
then people the, the the automatic next step for them is then okay how can we how can we make it into something that's usable for humans because you can always do things in a mice that you cannot do in a human so i think the next step they are taking now is develop treatments in the mice that would potentially also be possible in humans so they have now done whatever they could with the mice but they know that this is not feasible to do in humans so they are now kind of further developing this um, and then checking if it works in the mice again potentially and then if it works again also in this in this more translatable way then they would bring it potentially to the humans and the first experiments will uh, be starting there i don't know how far they are i i know that that um, people want to bring it very fast to the clinic as if, if possible um, but of course it's always a bit secret how far they are so i cannot give you an answer but i know that people are working on bringing it to the humans so what exactly does this treatment look like um so is it just uh, injecting or making cells in like a human ex express these uh, genes uh, and then let them be or how do you surveil this exper uh, experiment experiment uh, Yeah, so I think what they did in the mice now, and that's why I'm talking about bringing it to the humans is, is the next step, is that they actually brought in a virus expressing it. So you just bring it in into the into the animal and it comes into all your cells and then starts rejuvenating it. But of course, we cannot do that in, in humans. So we need to to develop ways in bringing it really targeted to, for example, specific tissues, um, because you don't want it everywhere in your body. Um, and then... And so that's, I think, the next step that they will now try to see, okay, how can we deliver it to specific organs or specific tissues um, to make sure that it only does, it has its effect there and not in the rest of the body? And how do we make sure that they do not keep expressing it, but that it's only temporarily and then it's removed again? So this kind of things need to be sorted out. But in the mice, I think the first experiments were transiently um well we're expressing it with viruses um but i think they are already working on other ways of of, of treating these animals to make it more um more translatable i mean with these fully differentiated cells um so i mean there's a reason why they're fully differentiated aside uh from them uh being like a part of a certain organ for example uh because like as far as i know uh that uh, i mean with cells dividing they kind of also um age to some extent um and then uh, so like does it is it all can it also be bad to turn these cells back into uh um pluripotent stem cells or Yeah, I think, I mean, we shouldn't do this to our whole body. And I mean, I also don't think we should bring all these cells back to the to this really native state. Uh, because like you said, they they have developed into tissues for a reason. And I wouldn't want my brain to be rejuvenated because I have no clue what will happen then. Maybe you, you lose all your memories. Um, you have You have no idea what will happen. So it's important that we find indeed the cells that need to be treated and that are the cells that are starting to develop um, into diseases. Let's put it like this. So the, the, the cells that are in a bad state, those are the ones that we should treat, but I don't think we should treat all the cells in our body. It's just, that's why I think it's really important to make it targeted so that you only target the cells that are in this case, um, developing into something bad, like for example, tumor, um or that that are that have uh, uh, their dna is is the, the dna repair is not ideal anymore so um they are in a bad state and those cells you need to treat but it's not that you need to treat all your cells in your body because that that will definitely uh not be good Okay, so um, then maybe one thing that is somewhat connected to it is like uh, like senescence, cellular senescence. Um, so do you maybe like, uh, as far as I know, this is like a mechanism that is uh, specifically for stem cells um, that are not supposed to divide any further, that they enter the state. Um, and maybe like, 
I would just imagine if this is this like the like this is the program for or that the body has to kind of get rid of it, the cells that are that are gone bad. So um, is there some like way then for these to be like to take these cells that have like I don't know uh, gone out of this whole dividing cycle and put them back? So with these factors. Yeah, so what they actually, so they target that a little bit differently, this in essence. So what they, they can actually identify cells that are becoming senescent because they, they ex, uh, excrete this specific kind of factors. So what actually the field is also working on a lot is targeting these cells specifically. So if you have, for example, in your liver, you have certain cells that become senescent that you then target these specific cells and remove them so that, that they don't excrete these factors and, and influence other cells. And by that, you overcome the problem. You can also think indeed potentially of rejuvenating those cells, but most of the work on senescence is actually done in identifying these cells and then ideally target these cells. So there have been some papers where they did this, where they made these specific mice, where if a senescent, cells be, senescent cell became senescent, that it was deleted. Uh, kind of, uh, it was killed. And they could also see that that helped the animals to live longer. Um, so it's another way of potentially making individuals live longer is by targeting these senescent cells. However, senescence is also there for a reason. Um, so it's also for our body to get rid of certain cells. So you, in some tissue, senescence is actually considered something good. So it's also, again, it should be targeted and you should really know which senescent cells to target uh, in, and not doing it on the whole body because then it, it could be detrimental for you. So it's, it's also, again, finding the balance and finding the right target. Um, and if we have done that, then that could also be another kind of treatment, which is already, that is already, quite, already in the clinic where they are trying indeed to... Um, to have these specific factors that could target senescent cells, specific drugs, and see how they work. Um, the results have not been so successful so far, um, but they are continuing to try to do this and then target senescent cells in specific diseases to see if that diseases can be um, uh, can be prevented or uh, well at least it, um, can be cured. So they do it, for example, with osteoarthritis. They then give the senescence factors or senescence removal factors and then check if these people then have less osteoarthritis. This kind of things they are doing already. So this is one of the treatments that are in clinical trials. Okay, so let me just get this straight. So there's two types of senescent cells. Uh, so the good ones that are it's where it's good that they're senescent and the other ones that are bad that can influence the whole tissue uh, and uh, um, accelerate aging of that tissue. Is that correct? Yes, it's, it's, it's some tissues it's good that you have senescence and some tissues it's not good that you have senescence. So I, I like, again, I'm not an expert on that, um, but it's known that senescence is also sometimes considered a good thing. So you shouldn't target the, the, the senescence per se. You should really target it specifically in uh, certain at certain places in your body. And so how do you target uh, the specific senescent cells? How do you target them specifically? Um, and also, how, how do we know if a senescent cell is good or bad? Um, so how they, how they did that now in the mouse target senescent cells specifically is um, by these factors that they secrete. So the moment they start secreting these factors, um, they had something in these mice genetically that would then kill these cells. So it recognized these factors and then it killed the cells that were secreting this factor. So that's how they did it. Um, but how to determine which what is a good and what is a bad senescent cell? I mean, people are working on that. I don't know what the current state is, um, but they are trying to figure out indeed, okay, where should we target it? And that's why they start with this specific treatments of um, diseases, so like this this osteoarthritis, because there they know that in that tissue, senescence is bad. If we treat it there, um, it might be good for you. But in other tissues, it's always known 
what is good or what is bad. Uh, that's ongoing research, I would say. What do you think is the mo the biggest hurdle to overcome with the aging research or the biggest challenge that has to be solved? Well, the biggest challenge that has to be solved is, in my view, convincing others how important aging is um, and that we should focus more on uh, on working on on ways to treat aging or at least to to find the mechanisms that contribute to aging. So we know that there are, that that's also the thing, we know that there are many, many different ways in which individuals age. So it's almost that every individual ages in its own way. And it's really hard to identify kind of one mechanism that explains it all. So we have this, this in the field, we have this so-called hallmarks of aging. So these are these nine things that people consider kind of uh, things that explain aging. Um, to group them, but that is, I mean, we know that there are already more than that um, and they are they are also interrelated and everything. So it's really hard to pinpoint the mechanisms that are really contributing. So we, we need to try to find kind of the different mechanisms that could all um, lead to aging and then treat them and also see kind of which combinations would, for example, be, be good. Because it might be that if you treat one component of aging, another uh, might kick in or that and that you really need to kind of find the right balance. OK, which processes need, do I need to target at the same time um, to make an individual live longer? Because that's also what we feel in the long lived individuals is genet that genetic um, uh, with the genetic component that it's not one thing explaining it. We know it's multiple things and it's potentially a combination of multiple things that are explaining it. So you should interfere in different mechanisms at the same time um, to make an individual live longer. And what you also see within the field is that still a lot of people focus on this one mechanism is going to explain it all. Um, and I think we need to, to get rid of that and be aware that there are multiple mechanisms that can all work. And we now need to find kind of the combination of these mechanisms and to intervene in the whole process that would then help you to to um, to become to stay healthier for longer um, instead of really focusing on this one thing ah that's going to explain it all because it's very clear that's not going to be the case it's not the rejuvenation alone is not going to explain it uh, it's not going to make everybody um, long lived it's a different kind of things that you need to target um, in order to make an individual living a long and healthy life so just so maybe we um we tell the audience also so what are the nine hallmarks of aging so um they are kind of designed in a way that they represent different kind of uh, processes in the body so one of the things is for example deregulated nutrient sensing so under that umbrella falls this mTOR signaling um, that i explained to you before um then we have, for example, telomere attrition. So um, our body, every cell has telomeres and there's, it's known that with age, your telomeres shorten. Um, so by the idea is that by keeping your telomeres longer, that might also be beneficial. Um, so that is one of the hallmarks of this, this telomere attrition. Then you have genomic instability. And quickly, I have a question about the telomeres. Can you just explain to everyone what telomeres are? So yeah, they are they are located at the end of your chromosomes, and they make sure that um, the moment your cell starts dividing, every time your cell divides, your telomeres get shorter and shorter. So it kind of it it at one point your telomeres get so short that then it triggers a process which leads to the um, destruction of the cell. So it's kind of a clock of uh, that keeps track of how often your cell divides. That's the very easy explanation. So the idea is that with age, your cell starts dividing and you lose every time a bit of your telomere. So it becomes every time a bit shorter. Uh, and at one point it's so short, then they call it the critical telomere length, then your start st cell starts dying. So the idea is that this could be a marker. So if you measure this telomere length of a cell, it could be a marker of how, how long this cell can still live. Um, but it's a bit, I mean, this is this is a whole field by itself, telomeres, because they also play a role in cancer, for example. Um, but the idea is then 
that the longer your telomeres have, the, sh the, um, the more chance you have of surviving. So it, 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 it's the telomere length is, is um, reversibly associated with mortality. So the longer your telomeres, the better. And that's also, I mean, what we found, we really see that longer telomere length leads to less mortality, but we do not know the mechanisms, how that will, how that actually works. And we also know that it's not the best marker, but it's one of the markers. Then we have the genomic instability. So with age, um, your DNA becomes, uh, every time it needs to be repaired over and over again, because the mutations occur with cell divisions and these need to be repaired. And it's known that with aging, that repair becomes less well. Um, so every time, the longer you age, the, rep the, the repair becomes worse. So the idea is also that that's a hallmark of aging, because in older people, we know um, that they are less well able to repair the DNA. And the idea is if you would improve DNA repair, that potentially could improve also your lifespan. And the opposite we know is true. So we know that people that have a defective DNA repair, they live shorter, uh, but it's not yet really proven that if you have improved DNA repair that you would live longer because that's really hard to, to, to prove. But it's one of the, the hallmarks that people are looking at. Um, then we have so-called epigenetic regulation. And this is one of the things that's also really hot in the field. Um, so what we know is that um, the, you have the DNA and you have these factors that influence what in the DNA is, for example, expressed. Um, so um, this is called epigenetics in an easy, easy, easy explanation. Um, and what we know is that there are specific um, factors, which is called CPG methylation. So in your genome, specific places are so-called methylated. Um, and when you actually calculate an age based on this methylation side, so that's what, what actually people did. So they, they took all this methylation all over the genome. And then based on those methylation sites, they, they first correlated that with age, with chronological age. And what they found is that this amount of uh, epigenetic uh, modifications is very nicely correlated with your age, um, with your chronological age. So they could actually see that it's a very good predictor of how old you are. So you just measure this epigenetics so or this methylation of an individual, and you could then say, okay, this individual is um, has an age that is uh, 60 years of age. Um, what they can also then do is, is take your chronological age and subtract that from your epigenetic age. So, for example, if you are really healthy and really, uh, really doing well, your epigenetic age shows that you are younger than your chronological age. So it's the idea is then that this epigenetic age says, tells you something about how well your body is doing, uh, although your chronological age might be different. And this difference is really predictive of uh, all kinds of phenotypes. And this is something that was discovered a couple of years ago. It just really striking how strong this epigenetic age is correlated with your chronological age and that the deviation um, tells something about um, your health. And it's it's now further and further developed into something that, that potentially can be used also in the clinic where people then come measure their epigenetic age and then based on that they could tell you okay you are doing well or you're not doing well and and you might get a different kind of treatment so this is a really um, hot topic in the field uh, and the person that developed this is, is also developing the same thing in all kind of other animals and shows the same thing so also in model organisms this epigenetic also based on epigenetics you can eat you can very well predict the animal's age um, so uh, then, so we are, we only have four, four now. So we have even more. So you have also mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, so I don't know how much you know about mitochondria, but they are kind of the, the energy providers of your cells. And we also know that if you have specific mutations in your mitochondria or that, that they, they work less well, that's also one of the hallmarks of aging. So a lot of 
mitochondrial researchers are also in the aging field because it's known to be one of the, the hallmarks of aging. Um, then we have cellular senescence, which we already talked about. So it's also considered one of the hallmarks of aging. Then we have loss of proteostasis. Actually, so with age, also your, your proteins uh, became less well regulated, kind of you normally you have a gene and it would be made into a protein and that protein would do something in the body and it would be broken down afterwards. And with aging, that process is, is working less well. So they call that loss of proteostasis in kind of that your proteins are not broken down the right way anymore. Um, so for example, an example is Alzheimer's disease where you have this, this um, um, tau in your brain that kind of... Um, becomes more and more, it, it, it uh, clumps, it's put it like this. And this is because it's not broken down in the right way anymore. And this is a form of proteost loss of proteostasis where a protein is not broken down uh, anymore. So it, 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 it uh, becomes a clump somewhere in your body and that leads to certain kind of diseases. I hope that's understandable. <laughs> uh, and then, and then the, I think we are already at the last one. Oh no, we have two more. So one more stem cell exhaustion. So the idea is also that you have a certain number of stem cells when you're young and the older you get, the less stem cells you get. So this is where this rejuvenation comes in because the idea is that with reju rejuvenation, you would make the stems, the cells more uh, stem cell like again. Um, but we know with age, you actually have a loss of, of stem cells or the stem cell exhaustion. And then the last thing is altered intercellular communication, which is quite broad, um, but it's kind of how cells interact with each other. And we also know that with aging, that changes. So cells um, start interacting worse with each other, and that influences how well you age. So those are the, the nine hallmarks that, uh, that people are mostly working on. And then, of course, so you have the people working on each of these hallmarks and then you have the people that work on everything at the same time by, for example, looking at the genetics like I do, where we where I don't focus on one thing, but I try to focus on everything at the same time. Yeah, that was that was actually a really nice explanation. I feel like that brought together a lot of the previous things that we've talked about. So I think that was really helpful. Yeah, so actually uh, my question is like concerning the differences between a disease and aging as a disease. So because like I feel like uh, they overlap a lot and you were also saying uh, that there's some like things that are related. So how do people then differentiate between the two? Well, what, they, what, what people normally see is they have a disease and they say age is a risk factor. So the older you are, the more risk you have of developing a disease. Uh, we see it differently. We actually think that aging is the disease, kind of. Aging is the thing that you should treat. And that the process, the process of aging is already a disease. So maybe disease, it's always the, the, the term that is that is difficult, but um, but you we consider aging as kind of the thing that is that is the problem instead of saying age is one of the risk factors for the problem. If you, it's maybe, if I, I have to think about if I can come up with a good comparison. Um, no, for, for me, it's completely understandable that, I mean, let me just get it straight, but aging should be and is right now classified as a disease, just like cancer is a disease or Alzheimer's is a disease or, you know, any of these diseases. And I think what's going to be hard of trying to convince people that aging is a disease is the fact that aging happens to everyone. So people see it differently to, for example, cancer or Alzheimer's disease. Whereas we need to understand that aging shouldn't happen to everyone. There's a way that we can stop this or slow it down. I, I, I think that that's what you're trying to get that to, right? That is perfectly... perfectly. So uh, what I just wanted to say is that I, I feel like there's the lines between aging and other diseases is unfortunately really blurry because uh, other diseases are accompanied by aging and aging is accompanied by other diseases. So it's really hard to say, okay, this is the specific aging effect that is uh, like uh, that is due to the disease of aging, right? 
um, instead of saying it like it's part of another disease. That's basically what it what it is. Yes, yes, it's complicated. I mean, I, I I really like the summary that you just gave. I think that is kind of what we are what we are aiming for to say and to convince people about. Um, but it's indeed the terminology that makes it really complicated. I mean, what what is a disease? Um, what is a risk factor? I mean, like you said, you say diseases are causing aging. That's what we don't think. We actually think that aging is the cause. So we think aging causes diseases. It's not that the diseases lead to aging. Although it's also known, of course, that if you have developed certain diseases, that you will age faster. So it's 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 a complicated uh, uh, combination of the two. But And that's why it also took quite some effort to convince kind of people to see it as a mechanism, as a disease. So we call it now disease, but but maybe as a mechanism that could explain everything because people would say exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. But what is then the difference between a disease and, and aging? Because aging uh, is, is a risk factor for the diseases and these diseases are a risk factor for aging. It's, it's complicated, but we see it as kind of aging is, is, um, is the underlying factor that explains these diseases. So we should treat aging. And that's why we wanted to classify it as a disease, because that's the only way that we could get this approval from authorities to do, for example, clinical trials. Because a clinical trial, you need to have a hard endpoint. And aging is not considered before as a hard endpoint. But if you now classify it as something, you can use it as an endpoint. And that is that's why we really fought for that. Um, and that worked now. So now they consider it as an out. Still, it's a lot of discussion about what is then the end point in aging, um, because it's not so clear cut as a disease. But we at least can start doing trials now to show um, by treating, by using drugs that should treat aging, that we can uh, increase health. Um, I mean, I have one, like, I have, like, a topic that I'd like to discuss that is a bit different from what uh, we talked about now. So I think aging the field is very interesting, but I feel like it has a bad connotation because of, uh, like, this whole, this, I guess, dream to some extent of people to become immortal, to live forever, whatever. And then also, like, there's a lot of nutritionists uh, that, or people that, uh, like, uh, want to sell, make money, I think. And uh, then, uh, like, like buy and or try to use more naive people that don't know too much about the topic and tell them, okay, buy this pill and take it every day and you'll live forever or whatever. So the field of nutrition is kind of like closely related because it's like the one thing we can affect a lot. But then it kind of brings down the whole age of uh, field of aging. What do you think of this? I completely agree. I think I think that's also what we tried. What we need to try to, to to make more clear that our goal is not to let let people live longer. That's not that's not what we want. I mean, if you let people live longer, but you do not let them live healthier, it doesn't matter. So really, our goal is to compress or delay these age-related diseases by targeting aging. And maybe a side effect will be that these people will live longer in the end that also the maximum lifespan will increase. But that's not the goal. And I mean, think we should make that more clear. And I completely agree that a lot of companies are trying to say, okay, we have indeed this, this magic pill that will make you live forever. Because that's what people also kind of are intrigued about, the, the living forever. Um, but that's, of course, the, the goal of the field is, is not that. Although, of course, there are some people in the field that, that have this goal, the main, the most people in the field have really the goal, find out the mechanisms, treat this, treat it, and then in that way, let these people live healthier. And maybe that we should make that more clear. And some of these medications that are sold might help with that. But there's also a lot of misuse, but it's with any kind of disease, and especially maybe with aging, because it's not regulated. So you can just sell whatever you want, and you say you can just take it, and it um, prevents aging. You take the cream, and 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 your your um, your face becomes becomes younger. They sell creams, and the they say that they could rejuvenate your DNA with with these creams. It, this and these are really big companies that do that. Um, so yeah, that's that's always a bit 
the the sticker that has been put on aging like ah these are these 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 weird people that want to make you live forever um which is always a comment that we get uh and we try we, we really should work on changing that image and showing no our goal is not letting everybody live forever because it's also from an economical point of view not gonna work uh, our goal is to reduce the number of years spent in bad health because that is good for the economy if you if you prevent the the most money currently spent on a person during his life is in the last year of his life because then they develop all these kind of diseases it's, it's a massive amount of money we spend in our healthcare system on treating all these diseases well if we can prevent it or delay it that would be the outcome that everybody wants but not that everybody lives to 200 that's not what we should be aiming for yeah i actually i actually wanted to say something very similar to what nico wanted to say before but that's why i think this podcast is so important and that's why uh, thank you so much for coming on because i feel like through this podcast we can actually get more information about um aging and how aging should be seen as a disease um out and just um this information available to a lot of other people that might maybe only be looking at websites where information is given by non-scientists whereas i i really i really think this discussion was was really important in that kind of sense as well to prevent that um yeah, I mean, it's 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 also I noticed it a lot when you talk about your research in the media. For example, we had this study where we looked at biomarkers of aging, and what we we found we found these markers that are predictive of how long you will live. So then directly there was a lot of press on it that said, "Oh, they they now you take my blood, you can predict how old I will become. Should we do this? Should we not do this?" But that's not the goal. Our goal has always been, okay, we do this so that once a person comes into the clinic, you take the person's blood, you can see, okay, this person is having a bad profile because this is associated with increased mortality. So we should treat this person and treat it in a way that it can improve this profile. We are not there to come up with a prediction of how long you will live when you cannot change it. Our goal is to, to find markers that are predictive of how long you will live find then the treatments to improve this marker so that it actually will help. And this is always, that's why I think it's also good to have this kind of podcast, that what you have to convince people about. Because the media always directly jumps on it. And especially with aging, they make it out into something, oh, we should live forever. Um, that's the, what they, these researchers try to do. They try to make us live forever. And that's not, that's definitely not our goal. So I'm happy that I can talk about it here. Yeah, actually, so I would have like two questions. So first of all, um, do you think like with the new technologies, like the whole genome sequencing, what is also used, like I think with, for sites with Ancestry.com and so on, like we, we could look into like these variants that every person has, right? Um, and then adjust maybe the lifestyle based on that. So do you think that uh, from a treatment point of view for the disease of aging, people should actually get their genome sequenced and then... Um, try to um, yeah, counteract their lifestyle. Um, and the second question would actually be, were you ever approached by any companies uh, to uh, produce a wonder pill that you could take? Um, so, yeah. So regarding your first question, um, there are indeed these companies where you can do this already. The problem is always, like I tried to explain in the beginning as well with APOE, that the genetic variants that we identify are just giving an increased or a de decreased risk for a certain disease. Um, so it's not as clear cut. So there are now, what people are nowadays doing is, is kind of combine the genetic variation um, for a certain disease. So all the variants that they have found, they build a score out of that. And the higher that score is, so the more variants you carry, the higher your risk is of developing that disease. So I think actually that, that that's the direction it is going. However, this is really disease-based because for longevity and for aging, we do not have that yet. We don't have so many genetic variants that can do that. But for diseases, that's already starting to happen, where you just then measure your DNA with such a company, and then that company calculates kind of your score uh, for certain diseases and then says, okay, you have genetically, you belong to the 1% the, the uh, 
uh, of people that have a high risk of developing this disease. So maybe you should change your lifestyle accordingly um, so that you can kind of prevent that from happening. Um, but for aging, we are definitely not there. Um, and like I said, there, are, if you really want one variant where you do draw conclusions on, then that's really limited. That's just only for really monogenetic diseases where it's really clear that you have a mutation in a specific gene and then you develop a disease. So that what they do with, with prenatal screening, for example. Um, but for really like aging and also, also actually for most of the diseases, it's just a higher or lower risk, but it's not um, saying you, you have to change your lifestyle uh, because of it, because it might also actually backfire because in your situation, it might actually do that you have another variant that protects and if you then change something. But what I want to say is for most people, like I said before, it's anyway good to change your lifestyle by eating less and exercising more independent of your genetic variants. So if you are a person that needs to have the confirmation from your genetic variants, then get it. If that helps you to... Um, to adapt a more healthy lifestyle, that's only good, but it will not, it, it will be very hard to predict kind of with this genetic background, this lifestyle works best. That's, that's not, not, we are not at that stage yet, but with the whole genome sequencing, like you say, um, we are getting closer to it because now you can get your whole genome sequenced for less than a thousand euros. Um, so it becomes much and much easier to do it. And we also do it for all these people in our studies and, and then really try to find these really rare variants that you, um, that you only see in those people or really much enriched in those people and see what they do. So this is really the next step also in my research that we start focusing more on this, uh, on, on rare variants that are identified using whole genome sequencing. And then your second question. I haven't been approached directly like that. There are always, there's always interest into developing something into a test, for example, like I just explained with these biomarkers that we identified, then you get approached, okay, do you want to develop this into something that we can actually test in the population? Um, but there's not really companies directly jumping on board. I know that the company, for example, themselves, with which we measured this, these biomarkers, they are building kind of an app where people then just let them measure these markers and then this app says, okay, you have an increased risk of so much percent for developing a disease or, or maybe for longevity um, or healthy aging. So these companies do it themselves, but um, I'm not directly approached yet to become, um, to become part of such a company. And I would also be hesitant because I, I feel um it's not it's a bit too early to to go in that direction and i think that the field should develop itself further and really have things that are well replicated and that is uh, seen in many different populations before we would start uh, developing something like that we know that aging could potentially be reversible in the far future but right now what could i tell my grandparents to do um to try to you know they're they're still healthy right now so how can we keep them healthy for a longer time? Or is it too late for them? No, so with very old people, it's a bit different uh, because they often have already developed certain uh, diseases or they are already in a state that they are maybe a bit less healthy from the inside. But what we know, for example, in, in very old people is that one of the, the, the risk factors for dying there is loneliness or depression. So. And so one of the things that will works really well for elderly people is, first of all, try to um, stay a bit active and that can be physically active, but also mentally active. Staying active is, is definitely good for you um, and also prevents some diseases. Um, so that's what you can tell them. Maybe it's for them too late to really change their lifestyle and that would not, so make, not make sense so much with your grandparents probably. But having them, letting them stay active, having friends that they can talk to and uh, to each other. Um, so the social environment is, is very, very important um, at, at very high ages to, um, to prevent also um, them from dying in the end. Because 
often these people become lonely. They don't have anybody else anymore. They they get depressed. And that's in the end, they also, their mental um, health also uh, influences their, their physiological health. And that's why they in the end die then. But so you can tell them that to, um, to, to stay active in multiple ways. So physically and mentally, so doing crosswords or talking to other people, having social interaction. Um, that's one of the things that's really important. And for your parents, they are still a bit earlier. They can still change their lifestyle if they want. Cool. Yeah. Joris, would you have any other things that you want to talk about or say? Well, I hope that I have convinced people that, um, that we should focus a lot of research on aging so that we also get money for that. <laughs> um, because the more money we have for research on aging, the better, of course. So, I mean, this is this is always my goal. I, I like to do also this, this kind of uh, more informal meetings and, and discuss kind of what we are doing because I'm really enthusiastic about it. And I feel that there is really something to gain, especially from this from these long-lived individuals that have their secrets, how they become long-lived. Um, and I feel that if we really find the mechanisms there, we can prevent so much damage from happening to our society in, in the coming years where we really going to get all these pandemics, like the BMI, the, the obesity pandemic, the Alzheimer pandemic, all, all these kind of things are, are, are coming our way because we, we get older, but we are not able yet to, um, to stop these diseases from happening. So I hope that I convince people also to to start working on aging and, uh, and maybe we will get some more aging institutes around Germany and around the world uh, that focus on this problem. Yeah. I mean, that would be, that would be really cool. I have to say me as a chemist, you know, I have nothing to do with aging, but it's always a, it's a field of research that really interests me. And I'm excited to see where it goes in the, the following years. Um, so do you maybe do you have Twitter or something that maybe you can tell the audience what your Twitter is so that they can keep up with your research work? Yes. So my Twitter is at Joris underscore Dalen. So just my name with an underscore in between. So they could easily find me on Twitter. I'm also following uh, Max Planck, uh, the Max Planck Twitter and all the other ones. So they might may also find me via that. So uh, postdoc.net and this kind of thing. I mean, maybe we can put Maybe we can put it in the uh, in the podcast notes then. Um, then people can immediately uh, see it. Okay, great. Then thank you so much for taking the time to be here today and to talk to us. I really enjoyed this conversation and I'm sure the audience will have as well. Hopefully we will keep in touch and maybe we'll have you on again at some point. Yes, I hope, uh, I hope I, you will enjoy the podcast and... Uh... It was really nice talking to you and I hope, uh, like I said, that also other people are getting interested in aging because I, I, I hope that I can stimulate people to, to think about it and uh, hopefully start working more. So that's it. We really hope that you have enjoyed the podcast with yours just as much as we did. We definitely learned a lot and we really hope that so did you. If you liked our podcast, then make sure you follow us on our Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram page. And make sure to follow yours on Twitter to stay up to date with his research. Thanks again so much for listening. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srinath Rankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye. Bye.